how's it going? Welcome to Screen Speak. It is the podcast that's all about movies, life, and so much more. I'm Jordan Anderson. This is my podcast, and I do sincerely appreciate each and every one of you for coming by and giving it a listen. If you have not done so already and you have a bit of spare time on your hands, please go ahead and follow the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts at. Please go ahead and follow the podcast on there and or download episodes of it because it does help support and grow the podcast. And then if you also want to, you can check out the Instagram of the podcast, which is just simply titled at ScreenSpeak Podcast. Uh, where I will post some movie-related content as well as some sneak peeks on upcoming episodes when I have a moment to do so. So those are all the plugs. Please do one or all of those things, and I will, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll just greatly appreciate it. So that would be awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and start the episode. So, well, I, well actually, first, before I get into the actual, you know, meat and potatoes of the episode, everything I want to talk about with this movie... Um, I do want to get the, the elephant out of the room, uh, the, the elephant in the room. Is that what they say? I, I, I don't know. I just want to address why I think my voice sounds a little bit off right now. Um, or at least it, it can't just be me. Like I, I'm, I'm hearing myself talk right now. I know I sound off from how I typically sound. So an explanation is owed. Um, uh, so earlier this week, um, yeah, yeah. Earlier this week, it was, uh, on Monday, I had had lunch, at least this is how I suspect that this all kind of transpired, but I had lunch, I had one of those, uh, hang on, hang on one second, I gotta, gotta clear my throat here, <coughs> uh, I don't know why, I wish I could have done that uh, more gracefully, but you know, you're gonna get authentic me here on this channel, so we're, we're gonna keep it going. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so Monday, I had a chop salad kit, I think that's what they call it. Uh, a chopped salad kit. I bought it from a grocery retail uh, retail chain, I guess, uh, called Aldi. And I've had chopped salad kits from there before, and they're normally pretty good, convenient, quick, a quick and easy lunch to have that is relatively healthy uh, because you're eating mostly lettuce. So that said, um, I I bought a kind of the chopped salad that I don't normally buy. I didn't think it would really be all that different. It had some some chia chia seeds or chia peas chia chia peas is that a thing? Peas? I don't know. There were chia peas. We'll just call it that. Uh, and then there was also uh, some quinoa in it, as well as I don't know some kind of dressing I haven't had before. But whatever the case, I ate it, and <clears throat> I began to notice. But, I mean, later on in the day, like towards the end of like the, the working day and whatnot, I started feeling a little funny, I guess. Like I just like kind of had like a little bit of nausea, I guess. I, I, I wasn't really sure. I thought, well, I'm like, you know, maybe I was just tired. I haven't slept that great over the last like week or so. So may, 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 maybe it's just that. But anyway, uh, I got home. Uh, I got home for, for my day and then... It wasn't long before that little, you know, twinge of nausea became a big twinge of of nausea. Um, So much so that I I won't get super specific on the details because most people don't like hearing about throwing up. But I definitely threw up and it was multiple times and it was obviously unexpected. I, I don't think anybody goes out of their way to plan to have a great vomit episode, but it ended up happening. And it was pretty uncontrollable and it was pretty sudden. And um, again, without going into a lot of the details, it was just really not pleasant. And I wasn't sure like if I was done or if more was going to come. I, I, I really wasn't sure. And by the time I stopped doing it, because I, I, I think I started doing it at like, I, I want to estimate that was like, I don't know, probably like six. No, no, not six, seven o'clock. We'll call it seven o'clock. 7 o'clock p.m. at night, I started doing it, and I don't think I was done until midnight, I believe. And coincidentally, I actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled for the following morning, and it had nothing to do with this, of course, because I was not planning this. Um, But I had this doctor's appointment scheduled, so I was like, okay, well, I'm like, I guess that's good timing, because I was already going to go for a couple of other personal things, so I should probably address this, too, because, you know, it's not normal for a person to just keel over and puke like that and, and have it 
be as as not great as it was. And so anyway, I I go to the doctor's office, address all the other reasons why I was there, and then of course I I add in like, hey, just coincidentally, doctor, uh, I ended up puking my guts out, and it was awful. And I just want to know, you know, straight up, uh, do I have to be worried about COVID? Because anymore, and you know, with good reason, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying it's not within good reason to have this uh, method of thinking, but it does feel like anymore right now, even if you so much as sneeze, cough, you know, clear your throat, I mean, even have like seasonal allergies, a cold, let alone the flu. I mean, every, everybody's afraid of COVID right now. A lot, a lot of people, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are afraid of COVID. So it's only natural to assume that COVID could be a thing. Um, I told the doctor, I was like, hey, like, do I need to worry about this being COVID? Like, do you want me to get tested? Because I'll get tested based off everything I just told you. If, if a test is merited, I will do it. I'm more than happy to do it. And after I told my doctor the, the story and gave her the, the, the doctor the, the, I would say, the more explicit details, because they're a doctor. It's the medical community. They can handle it. Um, I had shared all those details on there, and, and my doctor was convinced. She was like, no, um, you know, that doesn't sound like COVID on there. Um, just sounds like you had like some type of a stomach virus or a, you know, food case of food poisoning was likely, you know, after I explained the whole thing. And so I was like, okay, well, um, you know, so what should I do? And so, you know, after the episode I had the previous evening and lack of sleep and being, you know, extremely dehydrated, I would say, uh, I got told just, Hey, you should probably stay home for the day, hydrate like crazy and just rest, which I will say, Um, I did just that. (laughs) And I, and I literally mean, I did just that. Like I, I went to the pharmacy first to, to get proper medication. Um, and then I went home and I'm not kidding. It's like, I think like the second I got home, like I just, I, I went to bed and I was like, okay, like just go to bed. Um, kept going in and out of sleep. And if I did wake up, it was to drink Powerade or water or to go back to sleep. And I think that went on for like, I mean, like I said, it was literally the whole day. I think I kind of stopped doing the in and out of sleep thing at least up until six o'clock, maybe, maybe even later. I don't know. I was a bit disoriented because of all the in and out of sleeping and it being so unusual in my sleep schedule. So anywho, I just thought it was worth sharing all that so that you know that, well, A, um, at least medically, medically speaking anyway, my doctor does not suspect it's the COVID. So that would be, that would not be good. Um, if that was the case, I really wouldn't want that to be the case. And I'll just say full disclosure for anybody that does have a concern out there for this. Uh, I did have COVID, um, a a while back. I, I caught it actually at the very end of, of 2020. And I mean like the very end of 2020, um, new year's Eve, I believe was when I got my, my positive test result from that. Um, so I did the whole quarantine and, and all that stuff. And I eventually was able to become, uh, fully vaccinated as well. Not to get into all the subject of that, because anymore you bring up that stuff that's, you know, considered taboo or controversial to some people, depending on who you're talking to. But yeah, I, I really didn't think it was, I, I really didn't think it was COVID because, you know, I remember how I was when I got COVID the first time and, you know, if it did come on a second time, I feel like it wouldn't have just been like so sudden like that, you know, it just really kind of knocked me for a loop. And so anyway, the reason why I, I mentioned all that is because the aftermath of it, you know, from having a nasty throw up episode like that is that it, you know, made my voice be kind of hoarse and, and gross and whatnot. And then I think, with my immune system and its weakened state, it, it caused me to, I, I would say like, I, I, I likely have like a head cold, you know, because it's, I'm not congested. Like I'm not, I'm not like congested or stuffed up like in my nose, or maybe I am because I can like breathe out of my nose. Like see, like, <laughs> yeah, you can probably hear that maybe. So I can, I can do that, but it's like, you know, it's a uh, it deep in my head, I guess. I don't know. Oh, look, look. I'm talking kind of fast because I want to, you know, stop talking about all the medical jargon and get into the actual movie. But I'll say this. I am a grown adult. I promise if I think 
it merits it. And, you know, if like my, my conditions worsen or, you know, something that, you know, my cold medicine can't fix, I promise you, I will not take precaution. I, I, let me, let me rephrase. I will take all, I will take all the necessary precautions to ensure that myself and everybody else around me is safe because I definitely don't want to be a problem uh, for people when it comes to that. But I just thought I would make it clear for everybody kind of what's going on, why I sound funny, and that, hey, don't worry about me. I really think that the worst is behind me on this thing. But for the meantime, you're going to have to listen to my funny voice as I continue on uh, with this episode. So enough of that. <sighs> Let's talk about the movie. So I'm going to be talking all about the movie Jacob's Ladder. Uh, it stars Tim Robbins, and it's got Elizabeth Pena, I think I'm saying that right, and the late, great Danny Aiello. I also think I'm saying his last name right. Uh, most people know Di uh, Danny Aiello from uh, Spike Lee's uh, Do the Right Thing, which is another, another really good movie. But in continuing with the scariness that is this month of October and the freaky movies that tend to be a part of it, I was kind of thinking like, well, what do I want to talk about on, on this episode? Because I have, I have actually two more guests that are lined up for this month and they're going to be coming on the podcast here in the next week or two. And so for now I'm like, okay, this is going to be another solo episode. And I'm like, I kind of want to, you know, talk about, I, I had some like more, I would say like mainstream media ideas or mainstream movie ideas. And I don't, I don't know if this is I wouldn't consider this an independent movie. I, I don't think so, but it is from 1990. And I would arguably say that there's probably a number of people that I don't think have actually seen Jacob's Ladder. And I don't know. I think it's for that and, you know, a lot of other reasons that I'll get, that I'll get into uh, over the course of this episode. You'll see that there's actually plenty of things to talk about in this movie. Um, so let me, let me go ahead and, and share the synopsis on here. So, in this harrowing psychological thriller, Jacob Singer, that's played by Tim Robbins, is a Vietnam War vet uh, that's haunted by memories of war and the death of his, young, of his young son. As Jacob starts to experience visions of demons all around him, he begins to question what is real. And for that matter, is he going insane? And also, is he suffering from post-traumatic stress? So he's trying to figure out what's real, is he going cuckoo or is he suffering from PTSD? That's not good. Or, or could he be caught in the middle of some horrific supernatural battle that he just simply can't understand? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the synopsis of this movie. Uh, it was directed by Adrian Lin, uh, who famously directed Fatal Attraction. I'm, I'm sure I have some people in the listening audience that have seen that one. Maybe not some of the younger folks. Uh, but that's a good one. It's, a, it's definitely a good one. Makes you, uh, well, I, I don't want to spoil Fatal Attraction. Go watch Fatal Attraction. It's a good one. But um, it also it also says in the synopsis here that Jacob Jacob's Ladder takes you on a terrifying ride into one's man's descent into hell. That's my hell voice, I guess. Um, yeah, so I got a lot, actually, a lot that I want to say about this movie. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to take a, a sip of the not at all sponsored on this show, Kiefer Milk. Uh, Kiefer is really good. I mean, I, I'm serious. I don't even have to have it be. I don't even have to have Kiefer be an actual sponsor in here for me to plug it. I mean, I got to plug it. It's good. It's got good probiotics. It's good for your gut. Um, highly recommend drinking it. So there you go. Unless... God, I, I hope that there's not something that's like, you know, actually Kiefer can lead to blah, 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 blah. I hope not. But let's let's keep going and not get sidetracked on Kiefer. So I the, the, the first thing I thought about when I was coming up with what I wanted to talk about on this episode was to talk about my first impression of this movie. And in particular, because this is one of those... I'd say few movies because not a lot of movies can do this, but it's one of those movies where I very much remember exactly how I felt the first time I watched it. And I say that because I think this movie and I, I, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I will get to this point of it later, but this is not a movie I would say that is the easiest to stomach. 
and I don't think it's the easiest watch. I wouldn't even necessarily say it's like truly entertaining, honestly. Um, this is a disturbing movie for a lot of different reasons, and it plays with your senses a lot, which is a lot of the point of the film, is to make you, the audience member, feel like you cannot have a discerning sense between what is real and what is um, fantasy. And, and, and more so, it does it in such disturbing and, and peculiar and intriguing and interesting but terrifying ways. Um, so I just remember so so vividly the first time I watched this, which I, I'm trying to even recall off the top of my head when the first time I watched Jacob's Ladder was. Um, well, I know, I, I mean, first off, I wasn't alive in 1990, so, <laughs> spoiler, I didn't see it in the theater. But I, th I think I actually saw this movie, uh, we'll say like around five years ago. Yeah, I don't really remember why um, I decided to, to watch it. I think I just, I, I really like Tim Robbins, honestly, as an actor. I, I wish he would, uh, I wish he would do more movies today, even though I think he still does like really small indie, uh, indie movies. Um, but I like Tim Robbins a lot. And I think I was just like going through the guy's filmography one day and was like, oh yeah, Jacob's Ladder. I think my dad once talked to me about this movie saying how twisted and creepy it is and that I should watch it. But of course, my dad telling me that. I don't really know if I want to do that because he always liked to make me see a lot of scary movies when I was growing up and I used to get kind of freaked out by them. Um, not, I mean, dad, I, I guess if you're listening to this, I'm not trying to dig on you, but, uh, yeah, you introduced me to a lot of messed up stuff when it comes to movies. Um, but he never showed me Jacob's ladder. So I guess maybe that I had like some weird apprehensive fear in the back of my head that I'm like, okay, even my dad who shows me a lot of uh, horror movies at a younger age, even he's not showing me this movie. So that means it's got to be really, really disturbing and weird or, or something. At least, that, at least that's what I thought. So I just remember I, you know, I, I bought the Blu-ray cause that's actually where I got the synopsis from. I bought the Blu-ray. I think it was like five bucks. I think I got it at Target and I watched it by myself, which if you're ever apprehensive about a horror movie, folks, if you ever if you ever apprehensive about watching a horror movie for the first time, probably don't do it alone, or probably don't do it alone and have the lights off and be in a dark, secluded, weird space. I I don't know why I would say I was in a dark, weird, secluded space. I mean, I was in a normal place. I promise I wasn't like in some you know basement covered in duct tape watching it on you know some twelve inch TV that's in black and white. Why that's the image that's conjuring in my head right now, I don't really know, but uh, we're going to move on so that I don't focus on that really weird thought that just came into my head. So, anywho, I'll also say, just real quick, I know I'm, I'm kind of, you know, squirreling a little bit here, but I don't expect this to be a straightforward episode, you know? I mean, I, I got through this, like, gross food poisoning, uh, like seasonal allergy thing, whatever it is. Um, I'm still recovering my energy. My voice is all messed up, but the show goes on, damn it. And I want to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that I'm just being authentic on this thing. So here, you know, there you go. There you go. It is what it is. Um, so anyways, back to the first impressions. So, I just remember so vividly watching this movie, just not having, I, I was so like jarred from, from many different scenes and not, I want to say like for like the most obvious reasons. Cause like there's some obvious horror elements in this, but they're done really cleverly and very, very disturbingly done. So, I mean, I, I'm going to get into some of like the actual scenes here that really messed with me um, here in a little while, but I just, I just remember that when I got, like, when I got through watching the movie and I got done with it, it's one of those movies where when you're done watching it, you're going to be, like, checking behind your back and, like, looking around the hallways and the corners in your house because you're so freaked out you're going to see things. That's what this movie did for me. And I can, I can honestly say, I mean, I'm glad I own the Blu-ray. I am. Um, I think I have not watched this movie since the first time that, that I watched it when I bought it on Blu-ray like five years ago, but I still own it and I'm happy to own it because if I had another compelling reason to watch it, I would do it. But 
I don't I don't know. I mean, this this movie really messed with me on a sensory level, on a visceral level, uh, on a lot of different levels. But just want, I just thought I would share that because I don't really recall a lot of other movies having that peculiar impact on me. Um, and I'm curious, I guess, if anybody else has seen Jacob's Ladder, if you had had a similar experience to this, because this is a this is a very disturbing movie, but it, it is a good one. I mean, that's why I'm talking about it, because I, I do think it is worth seeing, even if it is just a one-time watch for you. It's, it's going to stick with you, uh, for better or for worse. Now, another subject that I wanted to cover on here was the subject of hallucinations. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to drink that old kefir again. So, hallucinations play a big part in this movie, because... Jacob Singer, uh, played by Tim Robbins, he is a Vietnam vet. He, he comes home from the war, and eventually he finds himself uh, working for the U.S. Postal Service, um, doing what U.S. Postal Service workers do, doing stuff with mail. Um, and he has a you know relatively nice life for for what he's doing. You know, he the, the job seems okay. He's got a nice girlfriend, got a decent apartment. Um, he seemed happy enough anyway, but. But Jacob can't seem to, like, get, you know, he can't seem to itch this this thing on him, this thing in his mind. He keeps, you know, just getting the sense that, like, he's, like, being followed or that he's he's seeing things, he's feeling things. He's ex- he's experiencing things that may or may not be real. And, and these, if you want to call them hallucinations, because even as the audience member, you're not even sure. You're like, is this a, is this a ghost movie? Or, you know, is, is he truly delusional? Is he insane? You know, is there something um, like a conspiracy happening against him? Like, what is what the hell is going on? <coughs> Excuse me. And so, because all these different visions and um, you know questions of reality were were plaguing the entire runtime of this movie, I thought I'm like, hey, you know, it'll be interesting if I actually do a little bit of research into the subject of hallucinations and see what it's all about. So I'm just going to rattle off uh, a couple of different things about hallucinations, and I don't know, maybe you'll find it interesting. So first off, the definition of hallucination is an experience that's involving the apparent perception of something that is not present. And furthermore, the the definition and those you know apparent perceptions of some things that are not present can take on many different shapes. Uh, or many different forms, I should say, which I do think is interesting in particular because I think when the average person hears about hallucinations, they right away just go to, like, I'm seeing something. Like, I'm seeing a person, or I'm seeing a shape, or I'm seeing a creature, or I'm seeing just something that's not real, a physical object. Where, in fact, just based off the little research I did, I was able to see that hallucinations can not only be visual, but they can be... Uh, based off smell, or I think the the medical term is uh, I'm gonna tor- terribly botch this. Uh, ol- olfact, olfact, ol- oh my gosh, olfactory. I had to slow down for that one. Olfactory smell. Uh, here's another medical one. Gustatory. I'm so sorry for the medical people listening. Um, that means taste. Uh, so you got visual, smell, taste. There's auditory, which means you're hearing. And then there's also tactile uh, hallucinations, which are all based off of touch and or movement. So when I was looking at just the sheer list on there, it actually made me, uh, I want to say appreciate the movie more, but it certainly makes me think more into what kind of mindset a person would be in that was actually experiencing this. And not only that, are they experiencing this on just one level alone? Because you can't always assume that it's just one type of hallucination. I'm, I'm sure that there are documented cases out there, which I would be fascinated to hear about, of people that suffer from multiple types of hallucinations. And it's, it's pretty crazy. And, and then, of course, you know, I think one of the biggest questions that comes up is, okay, like, even if I am having all these different hallucinations, you know, it's a million dollar question. How do I know? How, how, how do you know if you're, you know, losing your marbles, if you're, if you're seeing things? Because I imagine for people that do see things, um, whether they take on a physical shape or not, 
I imagine they feel pretty real depending on how strong it is. And, and that concept to me, I don't know. It's just, it's very, it's very intriguing. I don't think I've ever hallucinated something at least, <clears throat> at least to my knowledge. But if I did, I guess like if it was powerful enough, would I know? I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I would hope that if I were to have or have a hallucination of some kind, that it would be so out of left field, like so out of what the reality of the situation would dictate that it would be clear as a bell that whatever, let, let's just say I, I, I don't know, because we're talking about horror stuff. Let's just say I envision Pennywise the clown over at the water fountain, um, you know, at, at like a public park or not nah, actually not a public park clowns can probably be there uh let's think of something else where would pennywise not likely be at um he probably wouldn't be at the dmv right okay so yeah let's just say i'm getting my license renewed and i see pennywise there behind the counter being like you're gonna float too georgie Blah. um well i guess i would hope that i had the sensibility and self-awareness enough to be like oh okay crap i'm hallucinating again pennywise you're, you're not real like just just go away <coughs> um of course i don't think it's that simple like even if you do know that you're hallucinating i mean <clears throat> like what are you gonna do just turn it off i don't think it works that way in fact a bit of a sidetrack but it is still on the subject of hallucinations and jacob's ladder and whatnot I think one of the most brilliant movies that that tackles um, hallucinations in a realistic way, especially from the um, the person's point of view that's having them, is A Beautiful Mind with with Russell Crowe, um, Jennifer Connelly, Ed Harris, directed by Ron Howard. Um, it's it's brilliantly done in that, and what I love about that story in particular, which again, this is not about A Beautiful Mind, but I just want to touch on it, is that. Even when uh, John Nash, uh, Russell Crowe's character, is eventually able to determine that he is seeing people that are not real, I mean, he does try some medications and stuff for a while, but it never really works for him. And eventually, he's able to come up with a system where they're still there, but he doesn't give them attention. <clears throat> he doesn't give them focus. He just essentially ignores them. And that's endlessly fascinating to me thinking that somebody could have the mental fortitude and strength to be able to know that something in their in their realm of you know in, in their in their line of sight is fake is not real non-existent it's not it's not here and they're able to separate the two i mean i don't know like like does does that not fascinate anybody else out there that that's actually possible i, I don't know Anyways, so realistically speaking, though, not talking about the movies, let's talk about, you know, how are you going to know if you are hallucinating? According to my very brief internet research that I did, um, this is how you know. You will possibly have feelings of things on your body, like uh, sensations, things crawling around your body that aren't actually there. Um, one of the more common ones based off the auditory, um, uh, hallucinations is you could be, you could be hearing things you could be, and, and those things from what I saw that it could be anything from noises, taps, uh, music even, uh, could be, could be voices, which that's, that to me is one of the freaking creepier ones on there. Honestly, like if, if I, like if I heard a song, uh, like let's say I had a, I don't know why this is popping in my head, but let's say I had 38 specials hold on loosely stuck in my head, uh, or I couldn't stop hallucinating it. Uh, I mean, it would suck, uh, but I, I feel like I would eventually be able to hopefully tune it out, you know, but like, God, it, it'd be, it'd be weird if it came up at the wrong time, right? Like if you were, I don't know, this is going to sound weird. Like if you were at a funeral and, you know, the person's being lowered in the ground. It's very sad. It's very somber. And then all of a sudden, but hold on loosely. -da -da -da, and don't let it go. -da 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 -da. You'd be like, okay, hallucinations. Like, you need to stop. This is not cool. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. You, you know, you're probably listening to that. And you're like, you know, I, I think this guy, this guy might be. You, you might be hallucinating some things right now. I promise you, I'm not. It is just... 
it was just me trying to get back to a hundred percent people. That's what it is. So let's see. We talked about the feeling on the body, hearing noises, hearing voices. Um, apparently there's been some documented cases of hallucinations where voices can tell you things. That's really alarming. And I don't know. One of the things I always wonder about that is like, is it a voice that, you know, is it like just a made up voice? Like you just, like you heard some, you know, you just conjure up a voice out of thin air. Is it based off someone, you know, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. Um, let's see. So you can also know if you're hallucinating by seeing objects, uh, beings, which that's pretty freaky. I don't know what that exactly entails. Uh, patterns of light. So could be visual treat or nightmare, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Uh, or by smelling things or tasting things that are uh, heightened, um, false from reality, and aka not real. So, <clears throat> not that I'm a doctor, and I promise you I'm not, but I guess if you have experienced one, I sound like one of those like TV ad people, if you have experienced one or all of these conditions, you may be entitled to compensation and or you're probably losing your marbles. So please contact the number that you see on your TV screen. Um, and, and yeah, good luck. Um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I guess if any of those things are happening to you, you, you might be hallucinating. But it's an interesting subject. And again, it's, it's maddening when you're watching Jacob's Ladder because, uh, yeah. I think you as the audience member, you don't know if it's all real or fake. And even in the end, which I won't spoil it because this is actually a movie I want people to see, uh, you know, even in the end, uh, you, you don't really know like 100%. I mean, like you have a better idea by the time the ending of the movie comes around, but there are still questions that stand out and just a disturbing sense of uncomfortability that comes with this movie that, again, it lingers it lingers with you long after this movie is done. I mean, like I said, I'm still remembering my exact feelings in my bones to this day from a movie that I watched like five years ago. So take that, take that for what you will. Ah, thank you, Kiefer. That tasted good. All right. So moreover, uh, is that, a, is that an expression? Moreover? That's, I don't think so. Um, so, Continuing on my limited medical research into hallucinations, I also looked up a whole list of series for things that can cause it because, again, I'm just going to go off my general assumption and assuming that my general assumption means the general population's assumption. Um, hallucinations, uh, well, I think a lot of people just assume that you're insane, that, you know, you have like schizophrenia or something like that. Or, you know, uh, you have PTSD, which, again, this movie deals with uh, the PTSD side of things for sure. Um, but it did get me thinking, well, what are a lot of the other reasons that someone could have hallucinations on something? So I looked up a list and I made it up and now I'm going to share it with you all here. So here is the complete list, at least to my knowledge, of things that can cause hallucination. Here we go. So we got alcohol and or drug usage, uh, and or withdrawal of the drugs or alcohol. There's auditory nerve disease, uh, disassociative identity disorder, also known as DID. Uh, famously, that was portrayed in the movie Split uh, with James McAvoy, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, there's epilepsy, glaucoma, hallucin hallucinogen use. I, I, I'm sure there is a difference between a typical hallucinogen and a drug. But can't some drugs be hallucinogens? I, I don't know. Uh, there's metabolic conditions, middle or inner ear diseases, migraines, narcolepsy. Um, is narcolepsy the one where you can't sleep or you fall asleep like while standing up? I, I don't know. Um, there's neuro neurologic, yeah, neurologic uh, disorders. Uh, this one's a medical mouthful, so I'm gonna butcher it. I'm gonna go really slow on this one. Uh, op the thalamic diseases, uh, whatever that one is, someone can tell me. Uh, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, so that you know, there we go, PTSD. Uh, schizo schizoaffective disorder is that is that the official term for schizophrenia, or maybe maybe they're different. I don't know. Uh, sleep deprivation uh, and or stroke. So there you go. That's the list that I found on the web when it comes to the causes of hallucination. Um, 
So touching base on, on one of these in particular, I'm always actually interested with the sleep deprivation one, uh, which in the case of this movie, Jacob's Ladder, I, I admit I have not watched it um, since it came out, but I do remember that given his um, pretty disturbing and an uncomfortable psychological state, I don't think the guy's getting much sleep. So you have to wonder too, if some of these things happening to him are a result of him being like some sort of insomniac or not being able to rest. Uh, I can't say if someone is more familiar with the movie, they could probably correct me on that, but I'm still interested by it. The fact that a person can stay awake for a long enough time period that their body and their mind, their mind in particular, <coughs> starts to uh, starts to play tricks on them. It's uh, it's weird. It's just it's it's very strange. But I'm I'm sure chemically speaking, from a chemical balance standpoint in the body, I, I'm sure there is data out there that that can support a lot of the different reasons for why. Because I can only imagine that your brain. Uh, you know, for one of one of many reasons, but I imagine the brain in particular is likely not getting all the uh, fluids or oxygen or whatever it is that it needs to be running at 110 percent. Because if you're someone that doesn't suffer from any sort of mental health and you start going without sleep long enough that you're freaking seeing things, well, that's powerful. That that's powerful, and <clears throat> and yeah, it's just. Hang on, I'm adjusting to my chair here. So, yeah, it, it's just, it's it's incredibly powerful to think how how crazy the mind is, how expansive it is, and how different it is, and just, and, and all the different variances of it, but but in particular, when we're thinking of, like, hallucinations and, and all that, it's just, the mind is capable of a lot. I think that's, that's what I want to leave you with when I'm, when we're, you know, talking about this subject is hallucinations. They're disturbing. Um, it's a fascinating subject, but <clears throat> ultimately I, in a weird way, I find it a very fascinating subject that the mind is capable of as many things it is as it is. And I'm honestly sure to this day that there's still plenty that we don't know about it. And the subject of hallucinations, I'm sure there's a lot to be learned out there, but anyhow, I thought you, I, yeah, why did I, why did I do that? Uh, I thought, why can't, oh my gosh, I keep, it's like I'm having the, you know, I'm in like one of those blooper reels in a movie. I can't get my lines right. Not that I have lines. I promise you, I don't. I thought that that information would be interesting. That is what I was trying to say. I don't know why I had the pause and go through it like really, really slow like that. But you know, it is what it is. Um, Okay. So I want to talk about some of those standout scenes in this movie. Some of those scenes in this movie that really stuck with me that I remember even from the first viewing of this freaky movie. So one in particular, and I think it's a lot of people's number one for this crazy movie, is the dance sequence or party sequence in Jacob's apartment. Um, If you have YouTube, I'm actually going to encourage, yeah, I'm going to encourage this. If you have access to YouTube, even if you haven't seen this movie, I promise you could watch this one clip out of context from the whole movie. It's not going to spoil anything. And I challenge you to watch that scene. Like, don't distract yourself. Like, let you let you let let it sink in. Watch that three minute or so scene and not be disturbed. It is bananas. It's crazy. So I'll do a little play by play here. So Jacob comes into his apartment, sees like there's a bunch of people there. His girlfriend's had having some friends over. They're having a party. They got some James Brown playing in the background. It's, you know, it's a good time. You're kind of bumping. You're kind of enjoying the music. And Jacob's this little, you know, not little. He's a tall, awkward, timid guy. And, you know, he's like, oh, okay. Like, I'm kind of tired. I work at the post office. I'm possibly seeing demons and whatnot. But, hey, like, I'm trying to be a supportive boyfriend. So I guess I'll try to dance with you. Um, and then eventually... Um, it's, it's brilliant how they filmed this scene. Like, I, I would love to learn more about how they did this. But eventually, like, it starts subtle where he starts, like, like light starts, like, playing tricks with him. Like, like he starts, like, getting these, like, flashes of light around him. And he's like, oh, like, you know, it's throwing his vision off. And he can clearly tell. He's like, this is not, this is not normal. And then he sees, like, out of the corner of his eye, he sees this man standing, like, in the back wall. But he's, like, looking, like, directly at him or through him 
looking very sinister and weird. And Jacob tries to get closer to it and approaches him. And then that's when this damn movie does one of those things in horror, horror films. Not saying other ones do it exactly this way, but if you've seen enough scary movies, you'll know what I'm talking about. What the hell is it with twitchy bodies and stuff that makes me uncomfortable and freaked out? Because there's multiple uses of it, but in particular, in this dance sequence, it cuts to this guy standing against the wall, and eventually his face is, like, all melted. He has, like, I don't even know if he has a bottom, but, like, his head and neck, like, starts, like, twitching, like, all over the place. And it's very disturbing, very freaky. It's definitely not of this world. And... Yeah, it's really, really disturbing. Um, so he sees that, and then he starts, like, yeah, of course he starts, you know, really freaking out after seeing that. But then, very strangely enough, you know, the camera's kind of going all around him. It's like, you know, all the lights are there, the shaky head guy's there. And so <clears throat> there's there's all these things happening, and it's filmed so brilliantly so that you can see. He's like, I can't even process, like, what the hell is happening right now. But then it gets worse. Then he sees there's this guy that's dancing with his girlfriend that in a lot of quick cuts, they don't show a lot of it, but they show enough of it that you're like, uh, what? Well, um, I don't know how to put this, so I'll do my best. So this guy dancing with his girlfriend is, I guess, a demon or like transforms into a demon. I'm not sure because they have all these little quick cuts and flashes and disturbing angles where it shows like she's dancing and like feeling the music, but then like there's this tail coming in between her legs and it's like wrapping around her legs and it's like twitching all around the floor in the area and stuff. And then eventually it's not really shown directly, but this is where it gets weird as if it wasn't weird enough already. Um, it, it looks like the person uh, dancing with her, the end or demon is, is possibly um, having sex with, with his girlfriend on the dance floor Again, it's not really, it's not really like explicitly shown, but they definitely show like this weird, like erotic thing that's happening with, with his girlfriend and this dancing demon guy. And then like eventually this is, I mean, this is where it gets, it's, it's very, it's hard to forget a scene like this. I mean, people, it really is. And then eventually, like, I think like the tail or something like, she like goes up through her and like out through her mouth or something. And that, and that's when Jacob just completely loses it and just like freaks out. He like runs away and collapses to the floor. Um, it all happens so fast in the movie, but it's, it's freaking bananas. If you have not, like I said, even if you're not going to watch the movie, you watch that scene. Ugh, ugh, just freaking gross. And, uh, and, and also, well, well, it sticks with you, I guess. Uh, and then the the other scene that I found very, <clears throat> hang on here. <clears throat> the other scene that I found very disturbing, if not equally so, is, I think there's a few of them in the movie, but to keep it simple, I'll just call it the hospital scene where Jacob has this incident with his back and he's, you know, he, he gets taken to an emergency room and he's like get a hold of my uh my chiropractor which i believe that's uh danny aiello and whatnot and it seems i guess relatively routine for the moment you know doctors standard guys asking him pretty you know standard medical questions but then once jacob is strapped onto this hospital bed uh, on a gurney i think is the term the gurney doesn't hardly have I mean, it seems like it's a very old gurney. It has, like, these rickety wheels um, on the base of it. Or the base of it? The bottom of it? Whatever. You get, you get what I'm saying. So, eventually he's being wheeled through this hospital, but then it becomes it becomes apparent to Jacob, or at least in his mind, and again, we don't even know if it's real or not. For all we know, this could be. We don't know. He is progressively being taken into a darker and nastier section of this hospital. And I mean, like it gets like weird. It's again, it's, it's hard for me to describe it without you like actually seeing the scene, but like, let's, I'll just put it this way. What starts off as a clean hospital eventually ends up what it looks like. Doctors just like pushing him through like some dystopian ghetto, uh, or just crime, dirty dirty place a dirty broken down rundown hospital I'll call it that it eventually gets like to a nasty place like that and then eventually it's like him in a psych ward or a mental ward and then eventually eventually 
they start wheeling him past like body parts on the floor and blood and guts. And until eventually they have him in this really dark room and there's like 15 doctors all creepily masked up. You can't see their faces. So like they're devoid of any personality. And then he's, he's freaking out. He's crying and brilliant acting from Tim Robbins. And then he sees his girlfriend. He's just like, Oh my God, honey. He's like, please, Jesus, like get me out of here. He's like, I think I'm losing it. And they're, and one of the doctors is like, you're dead. You're dead, Jacob. You like, there is nowhere to go. And again, as the viewer, you're just like, this is one of the worst nightmares that you could have in a medical setting. Like, one, it's like you're already in such a vulnerable position when you are being worked on medically. Not that I've had surgery just yet, but... <coughs> excuse me. Not that I've had surgery just yet, but I've, I've been in the hospital before for other, you know, for other things. And yeah, it's, it's a vulnerable place. So can you imagine being in that vulnerable place, but you're tied up uh, you're kind of at this point there against your will and people are going to be doing things to you that you have no idea about, right? It's crazy. And then eventually like the scene like cuts to black after like it shows him getting this big syringe jam through his head. Not kidding. It's crazy. So those, the, I, I'd say those two scenes in particular, they stand out. And then like all the different uses of the crazy head shaking in this movie are ugh, like they are awful, <laughs> uh, awful, awful in the scariest way possible, uh, I guess, but it's so well done. That's the, that's the thing I have to commend for this movie. I mean, as much as it disturbs me, it's well done. It's, it's, this is a great, this is a great horror movie. It really is. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I wanted to touch on this too. I want to touch on the subject of, of, uh, what can drive you insane like what? What really can drive you bananas? What can what can drive you cuckoo? Um, or for that matter, what is insanity? Well, according again to my limited research, uh, apparently the definition of insanity is it's mental illness uh, that has such a severe nature that the person having the experience cannot tell the difference between fantasy and reality. In other words, madness. I don't know why I said it like that, but madness. You think this is madness? This is Sparta! Okay, why are... We're not... Yeah. Yep. Come on, I had to do it. I had to do it, okay? if You cannot expect me, a guy that likes to talk about movies, to say the word madness and not think of 300. I mean, come on. Just... <sighs> Anywho. Back to the subject of insanity and mental illness and, and what can lead you to that place. It did get me thinking, can fear drive you to insanity? Well, I don't know because I feel like that's not something you can really say for yourself unless you're experiencing it or you know someone personally that has. And since I am neither of those or I, I haven't I haven't experienced it and I don't know anyone that's experienced it, I would say if I was in the situation that Jacob Singer, aka Tim Robbins, is in this movie... Yeah, you better believe it. You better believe it that if I was, if I was having this kind of stuff happen to me, yeah, I'd be in the loony bin. You you put the straight jacket on me, it would happen, no question. I would challenge anybody to have this kind of shit happen to them and not be like, okay, um, not only am I cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but you better put me in the room with all the mattresses and, and leave me there because I'm no doubt going to be a menace, I don't know, to society. Is that... That's not the right. Why would you be a menace to society? I, I don't think so. Act, actually, you know what? In this day and age, if someone's like truly insane and they're not like, you know, being given mental treatment or not mental treatment, if they're not being supported or uh, being treated uh, for their mental diseases, then well, they'd probably just become a YouTube video. You know, I'll say it. That's that's probably what would happen. People, people these days can make entertainment out of just about anything, even people that are having mental crises and are in mental peril, which, again, I'm not laughing about that. It's just uh, it's just one of those things. Um, but anyways, it's, it's just something to think about. So, yeah, think about that one, too. If you were scared enough from something, do you think it could drive you to a place of insanity? Um, again, I know myself all too well. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yeah. I, I get scared relatively easily. So maybe. And now, <clears throat> so the last thing 
last thing I want to talk about on this episode, and then I'll start to wind it down, is the the subject of of experience in, in a movie, or or the kinds of experience you can have in a movie. And I think Jacob's Ladder is actually a really good. Um, it's a good example of a movie that gives you a very unique kind of experience. In this case, <clears throat> I'd say Jacob's Ladder is mostly a, a visceral experience, meaning that you, the viewer, the audience member that's watching it, the way the movie is sitting with you, it's it's more you're feeling it in a, in a deeper level from your state of intuition or from your intuition, your senses, rather than having the experience based off of learning something or having just pure observations of something or something from a logical place. So what I'm kind of trying to say with that is that even if the story of Jacob's Ladder wasn't that great, which I'll say the story of Jacob's Ladder, it's an intriguing one. I think this is a movie that even if you're only going to watch it once, it's going to hook you within like probably like the first 10 minutes or so. But it's experience, like experience wise, it's not, like I said, a typical like, wow, like there was a couple great parts there and there was a good message there. No, like like a movie like this, that's not what you're watching it for. You're watching it because you want to feel... Well, you want to feel something. I can't tell you what that something might be. It might be fear. might be paranoia, if that's something you want to feel. Uh, anxiety, uh, doubt, despair. Um, there's there's a lot of mixed feelings, I think, that come up from this. But ultimately, yeah, it, it, this is a very visceral experience of a film. And again, there's there's other movies, I'm sure. If I, if I thought about it longer or took a look, I could probably find other movies that meet that criteria. But... It does get you thinking, well, what are some of the other types of experiences that you can experience? (laughs) How many times can I say experience fast, right? Experience, 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 experience. Okay, I think that was five. Um, But it, it makes you think, like, how many other different types of experience are there with movies? Now, I don't like to put things in always black and white. I think there's a lot of gray for certain things, especially if a movie is having multiple genres uh, meshed in there or they're experimenting on one. So, you know, they're playing on things. It's hard to say. But I'd say most commonly people can have an immersive experience, you know, where they feel very involved into the world that the movie has created. They feel like they are an inhabitant of it. Um, People can have spiritual experiences sometimes when they watch movies, depending on the subject matter. I know for like a lot of people... um, you know, a really popular movie, uh, you know, a few years back was Life of Pi. Um, that movie has a lot of spirituality to it and very impactful in a lot of people that way. So there's there's an experience you can have in a movie that way. Um, there's emotional experiences, of course, if a movie's happy, uh, if it's sad, if it makes you afraid. Um, there's intellectual uh, experience, you know, where a movie makes you think, makes you makes you question things, makes you want to... Uh, converse and and learn more about the subject. Um, There's social experience. So like if you see a, you know, a really big popular movie with a big crowd, um, that's a unique experience that you're not going to share with anybody else because it's different every time. Every crowd that you see a movie with is going to be different. They all might react similarly to the movie, but there's unpredictable elements in there. You don't know when people are going to go, hoo, ha, hoo, ha. Though I'm sure producers and some of the talent behind the camera are probably working hard to be like, okay, we we think this is the moment where they're going to jump out of their ass. And uh, is that an expression? Jump out of their ass? I I don't know. Maybe it is. But I think you get my point. Um, But it's just interesting. So walk away from this episode thinking what kinds of experiences that have you had when you watch movies and, and more so, walk away and ask yourselves, what kind of experiences are you still wanting to have? Because that's, that, that's actually a question I would actually very much like you to challenge yourself on, uh, in particular, if you're somebody that really likes movies. Because I think if you do really like movies, you're wanting to constantly expand, grow, evolve. You want to see the possibilities. You want to see, you, you know, you want to feel that creative spark when you're watching something. Maybe not for everything, because again, experience is, um, it, it, it varies in, in its form and, and how it can, and how it can, you know, uh, 
what am I trying to say? Affect you, I guess. But I have a feeling that if, if, if more people would openly take a chance on maybe like a movie they wouldn't typically go out of their way to see because, you know, they may not like the actor, they don't like the genre, the director, the story's not really that interesting. For whatever reason, they just don't want to see it, right? <clears throat> but be careful of that because if you do that too much, you're going to be, you know, stuck into only watching comedies the rest of your life or you're only going to watch science fiction movies. And I don't know. It's just my opinion, but if you want to have a, you know, a, a diverse and... Uh, balanced palette of, of film. I sound like such a snob when I say that, but I don't know. I think it's true. If you, if you want to have a good understanding of it, you need to expose yourself to any and all different kinds. I mean, really nothing should be left off the table because it's one of the beautiful things that I love about movies. And I love about a movie like Jacob's Ladder is that <clears throat> I wouldn't typically watch something like this because of all the reasons I mentioned why it freaks me out, but it does a movie like this does expand my mind in the sense and, and certainly makes me think about things in a different way. And so for, for Jacob's Ladder, I appreciate that. For for movies as a whole, I appreciate the ones that can make me do that. And and yeah, that that's it. That's all I got to say about that. So with that said, <clears throat> I'm actually going to wrap this episode up right now. And actually, how about this, you know? Because I'm not, I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie to you guys I'm gonna be going to bed right after this I'm gonna pop open some Nyquil that's right I brought it here into the the office space with me because I gotta I have to drink some anyway before I go to sleep so I'm gonna have a little toast of Nyquil Nyquil for for everybody and I hope that that you sleep well. Is it creepy? That, that sounds creepy to me, but you know what? It's kind of a creepy episode, right? It's Jacob's Ladder. It's about, <clears throat> gosh, oh, my voice. It almost broke probably, probably from talking for almost an hour about this movie. Anyway, what I was trying to say is that it seems a little strange to me that I'm giving a weird toast to the audience at night with uh, this green vial of, of NyQuil, but... Yeah, NyQuil does help, especially in these circumstances. So we'll see if it does the trick here. Here we go. Three, two, one, down the hatch. Oh. You know, that actually wasn't as bad. And uh, did, of course, I'm not having the, this isn't the standard NyQuil. Uh, yeah, this isn't like the brand of NyQuil one. This is a, an off-brand one, but hey, I, I looked at the ingredients on it. It's the same thing, and I'm sure maybe someone else could probably say, "Well, actually, uh, the non the offshoot Nyquil contains a blah 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 blah." blah. I don't know. All I know is that it's supposed to help, and it's going to help me sleep, which I need. So, anywho, uh, <laughs> gosh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I I think I just need to go to bed. That's what needs to happen. Yep. All right, so I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Screen Speak. I hope you check out Jacob's Ladder if you haven't seen it already. And I hope that you have enjoyed so far the month of October for the episodes I've had talking about some scary movies. Got a couple more good ones coming up, so definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, and yeah, that, that's really all I got right now. So I appreciate each and every one of you for coming by and listening. And I wish you all a good night because this is my demon voice and I'll do a ghost effect to sign off. Uh, sure, why not? Bye!